Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, back by popular demand is Dr. John Scharfenberg. He has more views on my channel than anyone in the history of my channel, over 430,000 views. He is a 99-year-old medical doctor who last time was on talked about some secrets to health and longevity. And today he is going to reveal foods that may be able to prevent or at least decrease the risk of cancer. Please welcome back to the show, Dr. John Scharfenberg. How did you feel about being a, a YouTube celebrity at your age, Dr. Scharfenberg? That's pretty good, first time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think people know that you've been contacted by some of the number one YouTube channels in the world to appear on their channel. So congratulations on your success and your, the great health you've had. And so today you wanna to talk about cancer. What, why is that? Is that something that's in, that has always interested you? Well, last time I talked about cardiovascular disease, and I pointed out that that's killing more than the next five leading causes of death combined. But the next leading cause of death is cancer. So we need to get into that, what we can do about it. And there's things we can do about it. I can't now, wait to hear what they are, and I, I, I can't wait to hear your recommendations. Well. I, I, the first few slides here, the first three, I'm going to talk about some trends in cancer overall. Lung cancer death is the biggest thing we've got, you know, and that's smoking. 89 to 90% of our lung cancer is due to smoking. But about one quarter of the people who have cancer, it's lung cancer. More deaths from that than colon cancer, breast cancer, or prostate cancer combined. But there's one that's snuck in between here that uh, real, really jumped high, and that's pancreatic cancer. That's gone up. We aren't sure just exactly why. Now, the death rates have increased in, in uh, lung cancer up until the men stop, started stopping. And so it peaked and went down. And the women started later, but they uh, peaked later, and they've begun to go down. So the death rates increased for both men and women from 1930 until the peaking in about 1990, at 91 per 100,000 for men and 41 for women. Okay? Since peaking, rates have decreased by 56% for men and 32% for women. But 80 to 90% is due to tobacco. Now, the second cause is radon. I don't know if you heard about that. Before you buy your house, you better make sure it's not on a rocks full of radon. Because <laughs> that can cause cancer too. Okay? So now let's look at some of the other cancers. Colorectal cancer, 9%. But since I made this slide, I found out that pancreatic cancer is 10%, so that's higher. Colorectal has been dropping about 1% per year, so that's quite good. Pancreatic cancer here was 8%, but now it's a little bit higher. And then we have breast cancer and prostate cancer. Uh, the colorectal cancer, we have got that coming down, which is nice. Uh, we'll talk more about that later. The breast cancer is a big problem. Uh, we may even have more cases of it than we used to, but our treatment is so good. We're, we're treating more and we're, uh, there's less death rate. The prostate cancer went up when we learned about the PSA test. That up, went up real high. Uh, and, but that's, uh, came down after a while to the pre-PSA uh, knowledge. It came down to that pre-level, and that's about where we are now. But it's, uh, it doesn't seem to be as many cases of that now, but one pre problem is uh, we have, haven't been doing the testing as much. So that's quite a problem. Now, Dr. Willett is probably one of the world's sharpest people on the subject of cancer and food. And I'll summarize what he says. 
He said, evidence is strong that remaining physically active and lean throughout life, consuming an abundance of fruits and vegetables, and avoiding high intake of meats, of red meat, foods high in animal fat, highly processed carbohydrates, and excessive alcohol substantially reduce the risk of human cancer. But now we know something new about alcohol. I think now he had probably just leave out the word excessive because Max Griswold did the study of 951 countries and he showed 900, no, it's, what is it? 195 countries. He, he did studies and he showed that there is no amount of alcohol safe. We used to say one drink a uh, day for women, two for men might be safe. No longer. It's zero. Uh, so alcohol, we don't talk about excess of alcohol, we talk about any alcohol increases your risk. So we need to do something about that problem. Now, let's look at the foods that decrease cancer risk that we know. And this first slide shows most of them. You see the broccoli, the fruits, the beans, the tomatoes. But here's what you need to know. High consumers of fruits and vegetables who do we mean by high consumers? We mean the top 25 percentile that are eating the most compared to the bottom quarter that are eating the least have only half the risk of getting cancer. That's pretty good. Being vegetarian is really worthwhile. Now the next one. They've said eat 400 grams of fruits and vegetables every day. And that's the usual five servings. But here's what they said way back in 1996. Choose most of the foods you eat from plant sources. That's pretty good. Include fruits and vegetables in every meal. Include grain products in every meal. Choose whole grains in preference to processed refined grain. Choose beans as an alternative to meat. Here, the American Cancer Society is saying eat beans in preference to meat. So that's pretty strong. Now, let's look at one of the vegetables, cruciferous vegetables. They call these cruciferous vegetables because the leaves look like a crucifix. Now, I'm not a, no botanist, so I haven't studied those, that very much well, but there's uh, cruciferous vegetables include cauliflower, broccoli, and uh, cabbage. Those are the three big ones. There's a lot of them, but those are the three big ones. Now, non-smoking women who are at the highest quartile of vegetable intake versus lowest have an odds ratio of getting lung cancer 0.2, only one-fifth the risk if they eat lots of fruits and vegetables, okay? What about fruits and colon cancer? The relative risk of colon cancer was less than 100 grams of fruits or vegetables a day compared to those getting 200 grams or more is 65% higher, okay? So little fruits and vegetables increases your risk of colon cancer. Breast cancer is a difficult one. Uh, I think we may be even getting more cases of breast cancer, but our surgery is so good in our, uh, that we uh, treat them better so that the death rate is still going down. But here's something I was excited about when I found that if you ate carrots or spinach, more than twice a week, your breast cancer risk was almost cut in half. So the vegetarian diet is really good. Now, look at that paragraph in the middle. They did a case control study of 46 breast cancer cases, which showed an inverse relationship between breast adipose tissue fatty concentrations of retinoids and carotenoids and breast cancer risk. In other words, 
the risk ratio of the upper half to the lower half uh, was for beta carotene was 0.3. In other words, those getting the most beta carotene in the breast tissue had only 30% the risk of breast cancer compared to those with the least. Now for lycopene, it's 0.32. Okay, that's tomatoes, for example. You got the lycopene, it's red color. Then they had another thing that worked good. If you had more than one slice of onion a day, it reduced breast cancer risk down to almost one quarter. So this is kind of exciting. Carrots, spinach, uh, onions, and things that gave you the retinoids and carotenoids, beta carotene and lycopene, all these things help reduce the risk of breast cancer. Okay, pancreatic cancer. Here I said it was the fourth and fifth leading causes. It's up to about third now overall leading cause of cancer. They did a large study of adults, including 530 pancreatic cancer patients, which shows that those who ate more than 400 grams a day of fruits and vegetables had only half the risk compared to those who had less than 160 grams per day. Uh, so, fruits and vegetables again helps decrease the risk of pancreatic cancer. Now, too much smoking increases the risk. Uh, too much alcohol increases the risk. Uh, they even think lack of exercise may increase the risk. We think obesity may increase the risk. Okay, cruciferous vegetable. That's the broccoli, cauliflower, and cabbage. Those who eat cabbage once a week compared to once a month or less, has only one third the risk of getting colon cancer. Now you can tell that study was done in the US because overseas, many of these countries in Eastern Europe, Russia and so on, are eating cabbage every day. <laughs> now, these, these uh, cruciferous vegetables produce, have in them indoles. The indoles increase the production of benzopyranase, that's an enzyme, which inactivates the carcinogen called benzopyrene. Now we all get some benzopyrene in our food, in our diet. But if you have these indoles, they decrease the risk uh, by producing an enzyme which knocks out the benzopyrene. So it's interesting that we should be eating cruciferous vegetables uh, Frequently. Well, what else? Green salads. Now, I was excited about this. This was a study on people over 65 years of age. And I was not used to eating salads because I grew up in China and we never had a fresh salad because they were fertilized with human fertilizer. And you got to make it big dysentery if you ate those fresh salads. But in the, the Loma Linda Health Study, those using green salads every day, compared to once a week or less, had a 30% decrease in their death rate. So there's something useful in the salads. And I've begun to use salads much more when I, since I came to the States after that study. <clears throat> we should eat at least two servings of fruits a day. Those who ate 160 grams of fruit a day versus 240 grams per week had only one quarter as much lung cancer risk. Eating fruit, 240 grams or more per week, reduced risk of lung cancer by two thirds versus rarely eating fruits. This fact remained the same whether the person had ever smoked or not. So even uh, the smokers, the fruit helps to lower their risk. Those who use fruits more than 160 grams per day had less than one third the usual stomach cancer risk. Now, cancer and the stomach, in this country, we don't have much of that anymore. When we started refrigerating our fruit, our fruit, keeping it cold, uh, we never uh, had much stomach cancer. Stomach cancer went down, particularly. Now, 
I was having lunch with Dr. Hariyama, head of the Japanese chronic disease section, and over there in Nairobi, we were both at the same meeting. I had breakfast with him, and I was asking him about salt. My wife likes to salt everything. She's quite a salter, and she didn't have high blood pressure. So I was concerned about this, but he's the one that showed high amount of salt in one particular food increased your risk of stomach cancer. He saw how I picked food for that breakfast. We had breakfast together and I picked all those tropical fruits and stuff. And uh, he said, you eat like a nutritionist. And I said, yeah, I'm a nutritionist. He said, you know, in our country, we c- couldn't eat this much of these foods because everything has to be imported. And that's right. With Japan, they import all the food. So it's very expensive. But he's the one that decided, discovered that a high salt intake actually increased the risk of stomach cancer. And I asked him a little bit more about it. And with my wife, who doesn't have high blood pressure, but likes to salt, what was I going to tell her to do? I told her, you have a problem with osteoporosis. Cut down on the salt. That will decrease your, your risk of osteoporosis. You will not lose so much calcium. And so that's what I had to do to her to get her to cut down on the salt. But stomach cancer, since we've had refrigeration, we don't have much in this country. But overseas, stomach cancer is still quite common. Now, fruits and prostate cancer. Those who use fruits four times a week have only 60% the risk of prostate cancer. So there's something in fruit that's good to prevent prostate cancer. We'll tell you which one that is in just a minute. Now, foods high in both vitamin C and vitamin A, if you eat those, you have real good results in cancer prevention. Overall mortality rate, including cancer, is lower in those who are high consumers of these foods that are high in vitamin A and C. But there aren't aren't many such foods. But the yellow melon is high in C, it's high in A. That is very good. Maybe the sweet potato would be in there too. Those over 65 years of age who were high consumers of foods, high in these two vitamins, had only 30% of the mortality as those who were low consumers. You want to lower your chance of dying by 70%? Eat these foods that are high in A and C. That's the yellow melon, and I think maybe the sweet potato would fit there too. All right, can't I take a vitamin supplement instead? (laughs) Well, uh, we have a part of our National Institutes of Health, we have a nutrition supplement center. And they say, don't try to take a supplement that uh, will decrease your cancer risk because too many things happen that we don't expect from these supplements. For example, the risk of lung cancer were increased in Finnish and American trials where the smokers were provided with high doses of beta carotene. Now, the people who get beta carotene in their food, it seems to decrease the risk. But if you give them a supplement, it increases the number of people getting the, the lung cancer and the number dying from it. Here was a study that they gave people beta carotene. They had 23% higher incidence of prostate cancer. And the death rate from it was 15% higher. Now, you'd think these nutrients would be so good, would do the other thing. But this is why the supplement uh, section of the Institutes of Health says, don't try to take supplements to decrease your risk of cancer. A study showed no relationship between premenopausal breast cancer risk and supplements of vitamin C, E, or folic acid. But there was a strong inverse association between vegetable intake and and even the fruit intake. So if you get these things from the food, 
Scorner's Union is some good, but the supplements may not do you any good and may even increase your risk. A study followed persons over eight years and showed that those in the initial highest 25% of plasma beta carotene had a lit, lower risk of overall death. Only about half as many died. That meant they were getting it from their food. So, and cardiovascular disease was decreased. However, those randomly given beta carotene pills showed no reduction in death rate from all causes or from cardiovascular disease. So the Supplement Institute says, don't take the supplements. It's quite surprising. How about tomatoes? Tomatoes are very good. This is a study here done in Loma University. They did a six year prospective study of more than 47,000 men and showed the relative risk of advanced prostate cancer to be 47% higher. For those who consumed lycopene uh, 10 times per week, no, no, it's half as much, it wasn't higher, half as much prostate cancer if they had lots of lycopene. And they were getting their lycopenes from uh, tomato sauce, most of it, tomatoes, tomato juice, and pizza. By the way, if you pick tomatoes when they're red, you're going to get more lycopene than if you pick them when they're green. But they were getting most of their lycopene from the pizza, the tomato sauce in the pizza. Tomato users have lower pancreatic cancer also. They did a, a studies of serum from 25,000 volunteers. They froze the, uh, the blood serum and later analyzed it. And watched to see who got cancer and those who didn't. Those who had low le levels of lycopene were strongly associated with pancreatic cancer. So tomato paste provides two and a half times more lycopene than raw tomatoes. So tomatoes are really worthwhile. Eat a lot of beans. They're good at reducing a cancer risk. The consumption of beans may reduce the risk of colon cancer by one third in the general population. Now, here's something you should know. Uh, if you eat meat once a week only, that increases colon cancer risk about two and a half times compared to those who are vegetarian. If one eats beans three times a week, the risk is decreased seven to sixty-seven percent. If eaten daily, the risk is that's the low risk of a vegetarian. Now you should know that vegetarians. Eating beans doesn't help them to lower their risk any. Being vegetarian, they're at the low risk, and they can't do it any better by eating more beans. But if you eat meat, and along with me, you're getting high uh, amounts of fiber foods like beans, six days a week you eat beans, you don't, don't have any greater risk for uh, cancer of the colon than the vegetarian does. So this is something good about the beans. Now we do have a problem with some of the beans. They have too much uh, gas form ability. That's because of the oligosaccharides in them. But if you bring the beans to a boil, then throw off the water and do it again and again, three times, you will get rid of 60% of the oligosaccharides. So that helps to decrease the gas problem. Uh, the lentils probably are, are less of a problem than other beans. Now, you should know something about the soybean. They did studies at Loma Linda and found out that the people who use more than one cup of soy milk a day had only 30% the risk of prostate cancer. They decreased the risk of prostate cancer 
by 70% using the soy milk. So that was really worthwhile. Uh, and then uh, they're finding out ovary cancer too, that the soy uh, milk was good. Uh, so soy so is really worthwhile. Our problem is in this country, we don't use as much soy. We use maybe one gram a day compared to, well, people in the vegetarians here, they probably use 10 grams a day. But in Japan, they have 30 grams a day. In Korea, 20 grams a day. I've seen a lot of our people using uh, soy, but they use little strips of it. They aren't getting enough of it. I've been recommending to get the full value of the soy in both the blood situation, blood uh, uh, blood pressure, and heart attack risk, and all that sort of thing. Uh, you need more than what we're getting. These little strips on the rice doesn't help you that much. I'd suggest 100 grams a day. That means one of those little boxes take one quarter of it every day. I, that And we get real benefit from it. For example, the breast cancer. In Japan, they have a lot lower breast cancer risk than we do. And I think one of the reasons is uh, of all the soy that they're using. Those who consume peas, lentils, and beans more than three times a week have a 50% reduction in prostate cancer risk. So that's something you need to know about. Prostate cancer tissue treated with testosterone to stimulate cell division was inhibited by 50% with something in soybean, genesine. So soy has a lot of phytochemicals that are worthwhile. Using whole grains. Whole grains will reduce the risk of a lot of your cancers by about 10%. The fiber seems to help uh, in, in the colon cancer particularly. Consumption of vegetable fiber was associated with a decreased risk of ovary cancer to about, by about a third. Highest to lowest quintile of fruit and vegetable consumers of male smokers had a risk for lung cancer of decreased by about a quarter. Uh, for lycopene, only 28%. Lutinated xanthine, 17%. Beta cryptoxanthine, 15%. Total carotenoid, 16%. Serum beta carotene, 19%. Serum retinol, 27%. We're talking about the leafy greens now. The leafy greens are doing a great job of decreasing the risk of cancer. Now, over cancer is one of them. And here is our studies on lung cancer doing the same. Vegetable intake was inversely related to ovary cancer. But leafy greens were more closely associated with a decrease in risk by more than half for the highest versus the lowest quartile. Well, now, so what did we talk about? What foods really do good? The beans the tomatoes, the cruciferous vegetable, that is the broccoli, the cabbage, uh, and the cauliflower. Uh, what else does it? Fruits. We need fruits. But fruits and vegetables together are, are very good, cut your cancer risk in half. And so a vegetarian diet is good. It's good. Uh, soy is one thing that we haven't used enough to get the full benefit out of it. But if we did, I think we'd have a lot less cancer. Now, are there any questions you want to have on this? Oh, I've been, I've been so busy watching your presentation. I haven't even been looking at the chat about this. I mean, this is not necessarily about your presentation, but somebody actually did send in a question about cancer uh, for you to answer. And let me pull that up right now. And let's see. See. Um, they asked, they said they are 90 years old and they had a hysterectomy, a stage two rare cancer, and the doctor wants to follow up with chemo. What other options besides chemo are there? And are there specific foods to prevent a reoccurrence? Well, you know, I've talked a lot to people who have cancer. 
overseas, there was a group of about 120 people all had cancer. I talked to them all at one time. And I wasn't sure, since they all had different kinds of problems, different kinds of cancer, what to say. So I asked the experts on cancer, what should I tell them? They said, you tell them the same thing you would tell anybody to reduce the risk of getting it in the first place. So if you had cancer, colon cancer, for example, you should do the same thing that the people who don't have it should be doing to prevent it. Uh, so so that, that's what the experts are saying. Uh, for example, exercise. Exercise decreases the risk of 13 different cancers. So even though you have a cancer, you better still exercise, okay? All the stuff about breast cancer, the leafy greens and the nutrients in there, phytochemicals and so on, are useful. So we tell the people who have the cancer to do the same thing as the people who don't have it, what to do to prevent it. Now, I started with the first part, I want to start in the U.S. a cancer prevention seminar. Wait, excuse me, Dr. Schartenberg, are you done with your slides? Yes. Okay, then I'm going to take you off screen share so then people can see you better. And okay. Bigger. Okay. okay, that's better. All right, now go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'd like to see you full screen. Well, I was the first one to uh, start a cancer prevention seminar in this country. And I had people say, you can't prevent cancer. You can't prevent cancer. And one of the surgeons at a particular hospital where I spoke to the staff, spoke to all the doctors, he was sitting in there. And I said, if you people would get people to stop smoking, do you think we could prevent cancer? They said, of course. <laughs> well, don't you think there's other things besides smoking that could do it? And they had to admit there was. And, but they were saying, I should make my seminar like uh, how to lower your risk rather than prevent, because we are sure to prevent. Three months after I started my program, a big cancer organization came out with their cancer prevention program and called it the same thing I call mine, cancer prevention. So we think it's possible to prevent cancer, not just decrease this, but we think it's possible to even prevent cancer. Uh, now, I should talk to you a little bit more about tofu. Uh, some people were concerned about the estrogenic effect of tofu. From my last lecture, they, they were worried about that. And you should know that there is an estrogenic effect, but it's so much less than what a doctor, an OBGYN specialist, gives to a woman for hormonal therapy. Uh, now, they were scared that people might get more breast cancer with using tofu because of the estrogenic effect. So they went to the Orient. They went to Japan, China, took all the people who had breast cancer and had one breast removed because of it, and checked their diet and waited to see who got breast cancer in the other breast. The ones who ate the most tofu had the least recurrence. So that immediately gave everybody the idea, don't worry about uh, tofu causing breast cancer because of the small estrogenic effect. Uh, estrogens uh, do have a little effect, but small, small effect, okay? It's hormones that's going to, that you get from the, the doctor that prescribes it to the women that causes the, breast, the problem. We think it causes some breast cancer for example, the hormones. So if people take these hormones postmenopausally, I just got a question from a lady in Europe about that. What should they do? I said, take the hormones in low doses possible, as little in length of time as possible, because we know it increases the risk of breast cancer. Uh, so breast cancer is a big thing. 30% of the women who have cancer, it's breast cancer. So we got to do something.
to knock that. And uh, there are some things we could do. We mentioned the leafy greens. We mentioned the soy might help and so on. Uh, any other question? Uh, yes, a question came in from, let's see if I can say the name on this one. Uh, this is from Judy. How do you avoid losing too much weight on a plant-based diet? I'm in my late 60s and I'm having a hard time maintaining a healthy weight for my bones. <laughs> uh, so she's afraid of losing too much weight? Yep. Well, that's hard to believe. Now, I would go on two meals a day, skip supper. In my weight control program, if anybody has a hard time losing weight, I put them on the two meal a day program, skipping supper. Don't eat after two o'clock. <laughs> and that clears up the problem usually. That clears it up if they're having trouble. Now, you know, when people go to church, they know they're going to go to heaven because they're in the group that's going to interest in religious things, they're going to go to heaven. But they may not do what the preacher says. <laughs> so people in a weight control program, they feel since they're in a weight control group, they're going to lose weight. They may not if they don't do anything the leader says. <laughs> and so I know when I do my weight control programs, about one third of them are not going to do anything. We tell them to do. And so I like to have at least 60 in the group, knowing that 20 are going to drop out because they aren't doing anything. Uh, but we, we can tell people how to keep their weight down. And usually... Her, her problem was the opposite. She doesn't feel she weighs enough. Yeah. Yeah. For, for keeping the weight down... No, no you, she wants to be, weigh more. She's saying she's worried that she doesn't she weigh too enough. too skinny? That's what she's worried about for her. That's what she said. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'll, I want to know how fast she is. <laughs> how much does she weigh? She didn't say, but she's worried, I guess, for her bones. I guess, you know, they feel like people that are more slender maybe have That's, higher risk of osteoporosis. With, with heavier weight people, there's more estrogens. So they have less fractures, less bone problems. That's true. See, uh, now I have a weight gaining program. For people who want to weigh gain. Uh, you know what I tell them? What? I said, when you on a holiday, eating out of a park with a group of people, do you eat more than when you're at home? Yes, they said, yes. The more people around the table, you eat more. At a park, you don't have the same table thought. You you have different kinds of food you haven't tasted for a time. You tend to eat more because of more people. You have more time. You don't have to rush back to work. And listen all the reasons why you're eating more when you're out at a park. And put those things into your lifestyle every day. And you keep your weight up. Yep. Uh, John, who's watching live, says he knew uh, a couple of people in Utah that didn't smoke that died of lung cancer. Could it be from radon? Yes, it could be. It could be. There's a, another a group of people that can get a lung cancer that are not vegetarians, not uh, smoking. And, and it, it can, you, can get red, you can get lung cancer from other things, but it's a small number. It's mostly tobacco is number one, 80%, 90%. But you can have a group of people who can get lung cancer and never have smoked. So it's possible. But remember, I showed you data with high fruit and vegetable intake, even with those people, it cuts down their risk of getting uh, lung cancer. That's, that's fantastic. Judy says, how many carrots should we be eating? <laughs> well, there's no one food that you have to eat a lot of. Now, I should tell you a little bit about foods. You know, potatoes is something. It's a standby. Beans and potatoes. When we were poor, that's what we ate. Beans and potatoes. Okay. Now, up in Canada, there were some Britishers. They studied the glycemic index of white potatoes. Okay. How high does your blood sugar go up? when you eat 
bunch of mashed potatoes, just like with eating ice cream. Your blood sugar raises sky high. I have a dietetic friend, she's a lady, and she stopped eating potatoes entirely because she's scared. But how you cook it, what other foods you eat with it makes a big difference in the number. But when the nutritionist tells you to eat more vegetables, they don't mean potatoes. Sweet potatoes, okay, but not regular potatoes because of the glycemic index. But every time they do a study on glycemic index, they come up with a different number. So I don't really take any, uh, I don't take any confidence in, in that kind of data yet. I don't think we know enough to say don't eat potatoes because of the glycemic index, okay? So you need to know about potatoes. I eat them often. <laughs> yes, I do too. I love them. They're so, they're so satiating, you know? Yeah. Yep. So one of the viewers says, you were talking about cruciferous vegetables like cabbage, broccoli, uh, and does it matter if it's eaten cooked or if it's raw? You know, those foods also have a goitogenic index, cabbage. What's that mean? That means it tends, if that's all you're eating, it tends to make your thyroid get bigger. Okay? But all it takes is a little bit of iodine to overcome that. So if you're using iodized salt and you're using some salt, then you won't have any problem with that. So, so uh, is it going to cause any other problem than gorgogenic things to eat those things? No, not much. Now, over in Europe, we had a lot of kids uh, uh, with mental born with mental problems. Their mental brain wasn't working. So they were building in the Ukraine a new hospital every year for the mental cases. The kids that were born with mental problems. I said, you need to get them to pass a rule that they should use iodized salt. Well, they couldn't get Parliament to do that. Well, I said, then you should import it. So they imported it from Poland. And they didn't add the right kind of iodine. So by the time it got to Ukraine, it was dissipated, all gone. There was no iodine. So they had a real problem in Poland with a lack of iodine. And uh, in Poland and Ukraine both. And I was in these countries and told them they needed to get some iodine. Now, with milk, you get a little iodine with it. You know how? Why? It's because if you're washing the teeth of the cow, they use an iodized solution. Some of that solution gets into the milk. <laughs> and that's where they get that iodine from. The milk is not in the milk, naturally. It's added from the things they're using to, uh, to uh, uh, wipe the teeth of the cows off with. Uh, but, but iodine will take care of that. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, Gina wants to know why this information isn't getting out to people. It's so frustrating. What information is she thinking about? All that, of it. That, that you're giving about cancer prevention, things like that. Well, you know, doctors are not health educators. They don't have a course in nutrition. That's one problem. We need people who know this to get out. And where do they get a job? Health educators uh, might, might work with some organization like a county health department but county health department is taking care care of the poor people and to do health education and nutrition doesn't get you very far i tried it <laughs> i was head of a health department so i tried that it doesn't work very well but you have to have a little education and, and a little gumption to get up and do something yourself to be stimulated by good information so we don't have many health educators being hired uh, sometimes hospitals will hire health educators, but uh, we need good health educators working with the public. Now, for example, I'm speaking oftentimes almost every week somewhere, and I, the people have questions, loads of questions where we can really help them. And we don't have that opportunity for a lot of people to do. 
but we should have uh, churches every weekend. We should be, as a church, answering questions to people. Uh, so it's not the cooking or the not cooking of the cruciferous vegetables that decreases the, the cancer risk. It's the actual eating of them, if I understand you. Yeah, it, that's right. It's, it's the indulge. They have it whether it's cooked or not cooked. They have the indulge. But I would say, though, for many people, cooking them allows them to eat more. Because, you know, to eat a pound of raw kale is really difficult. But yeah. if you cook your vegetables, it, it yeah. reduces the volume. And because I eat a pound of vegetables, cruciferous vegetables at every meal. Yeah. It's not that much food. But if I were to eat it raw, oh, that would be really difficult. Yeah. Yep. Let's see. All right. Uh, I'm looking for questions in the chat. You know, we also uh, have questions that um, from your last appearance, I can ask those too, if yes, you like. Fine. And, and we'll refer to that video. It's linked in the show notes below if people haven't saw that wonderful uh, video you did. And so people wanted to know, why don't you use the term vegan? That's a good question. I had more questions on that than anything else last time. More comments on that. Well, when Watson used the term vegan in Great Britain, it had no religious connotations. But when Jay Dinshaw started it in this country, US, in 1960, he started the term, it had religious connotations. He didn't think it did. But he put out a journal every month for vegan. And he had a name for it, Ahimsa. That's a Hindu religious term, which means I will not make any money off any animal. I won't wear silk because of silkworm. I'm making money off the silkworm. I won't have leather belts, leather shoes, leather purses, because that's making money off the animal. That's what Ahimsa means. So that had a religious connotation. That was Hindus. And uh, what you said earlier before they started the show, the Baha'i said, don't cook your, your, your meal in the evening after the sun sets because you might kill more of God's insects that are fl flying around. You'll have more insects after dark. So have your evening meal before it gets dark. <laughs> That's what they used to say. Uh, but anyway, it had the, the religious connotation because of the way he did it, you know, he was surprised. He didn't realize it was religious terminology. Uh, he, he's a good man and a good family. I've been in his home. I went to his vegan meetings and they were arguing about whether they should have special cemeteries for the vegan pets and different ones for the lacto ovo pets. <laughs> and it was kind of interesting to hear their discussion. But, but with him, it with vegan had a religious connotation. And so I wanted to make sure that I wasn't associated with those kind of people. Now, after a while, some of the dietitians got together in the US and they said, let's have another term, food vegan. So you could wear silk shirt, you could wear uh, leather shoes, because uh, you're not worried about that business aspect, the ahimsa part of it you're worried about just the diet part of it. But even then you had a little problem with the, with the uh, uh, Christians who believe the Bible where it says, eat honey, because it's good. A vegan doesn't use honey. <laughs> but I understand what people who say they're vegans mean. It means they're not using milk or eggs or meat. Mainly that's what they're meaning mean by it. I understand it. But when people ask me, am I vegan? Uh, if I was a vegan, I wouldn't say vegan. I would say I'm a Christian. I'm not a Hindu. <laughs> I just make things straight. But that's a good question. A lot of people ask that question. Excellent. Okay. In regards to what we asked you before for carrots, Linda saying you said to eat spinach and carrots three times a week, but you didn't say how much to reduce cancer. Yes. Well, compared to what everybody else, else does, eat more. <laughs> <laughs> People eat so They're small. just taking yeah. top, top quarter compared to the bottom quarter, you yeah. know. Uh, People eat a dismal amount of vegetables in this country. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, there was another question that came in last time. Chocolate. 
Yeah, it was about the saturated fat in chocolate. Yeah. Uh, is that okay? They, they uh, thought I didn't remember my chemistry. <laughs> the chemistry has been the same. <laughs> you see, there's two saturated fats in chocolate. The one is stearic acid. That's 18 carbons in a row, no double bonds, so it's saturated fat, but it doesn't raise blood cholesterol. But there's another one in chocolate, palmitic acid, 16 carbons in a row, no double bond. That does raise blood cholesterol. Now, forget what I say about it or think about it, but let me tell you what the Hershey company thought about it. They were scared people were going to cut down on the use of chocolate because of this. So they had an advertising program. They printed right on the label what a serving size was. And they said, if you eat only one serving a day, you aren't going to get too much saturated fat. So with a chocolate bar, the first recommendation came out by the company on the label that you should eat only one seventh of the bar every day. So you take a whole week, week to eat the chocolate bar. <laughs> Who would wait a whole week, a week to eat the chocolate bar? <clears throat> and anyway, they gradually changed it. And last week for the first time, I saw one of these 73 gram chocolate almond bars <laughs> with milk chocolate. And uh, it said you can have the whole bar, a serving is the whole bar. Well, actually, they, they got enough uh, saturated fat that they, they shouldn't uh, uh, use it for that reason. But more, more than the fat, it's the sugar. Chocolate is bitter. People don't eat chocolate by itself. They have put, got to put sugar with it. So this small candy bar had 20 grams of sugar, but it's only 17 was added sugar. Now the American Heart Association says you should eat only uh, six grams, you ladies, only six grams a day. That's almost three days of all your sugar you should have for the whole day, three days. <laughs> so I think we need to give up the chocolate more for the sugar than even the saturated fat. <laughs> Yeah, most people don't eat just one little tiny square. No, that's right. Nice. Um, here's a question from the chat. It's, uh, it's about red rice yeast extract from Karen. Do you think that's a good thing to take for those that have high cholesterol? Uh, I, I wouldn't take it for high cholesterol. You know, it's kind of exciting what they're saying about cholesterol. They had all these people on the stats. And they didn't live any longer whether they took them or didn't take them because only those who actually had heart disease were helped 7%. The 93%, it didn't help them one bit. So I'm not worried about that. I just say, get your exercise, cut out the tobacco, cut out the alcohol and uh, keep your weight down and just eat a good vegetarian diet. And I don't think I'll take anything special just for the trying to lower my cholesterol. So there's a question from Claudette. Do the vegetables have to be organic? Do things like herbicides, pesticides, GMOs, do those increase our risk of cancer? Okay. Uh, the World Health Organization has a pamphlet out, answers to 20 questions on organic, not organic, on uh, G GMO foods. And they said there's no health problem. There's other kinds of problems, but not health problems. Now, everybody questions the WHO. So a group of Italian scientists got together and they said, they study every study ever been done on the GMO food. And they also said, there's no health problem. There's other kinds of problems, uh, but not health problems. Uh, then the University of California up here at Davis did a study, I don't know, 600 billion animals before and after they were allowed to feed their animals uh, GMO food. And there was no difference between the before and after. So we can't show there's any real problem health-wise. There's other kinds of problems. If you have a farm next to 
and yours is without GMO, but the wind is blowing from your neighbor's GMO farm, pretty soon the Monsanto would be over saying, you got GMO. You've got to buy your seeds from me and you've got to pay me for this. And so there's all kinds of ethical problems that we had to deal with with the GMO. Nice. Okay, back to some of the questions from the first shows. People were wondering, were you promoting the use of oils? No, I wasn't promoting the use of oil. But you have to have two particular oils to live. But you eat the food that has them in, like with the linoleic acid, common. You can eat corn, you can eat soy, and you have them in those foods, okay? Uh, the alpha linoleic acid is the one that's hard to get. It's in chia seeds, it's in flax seeds. But even with flax seeds, it'll go right through you unless you grind it up so you get some of the oil from the intestinal tract when you're eating it. Uh, so you, you can eat the food that has it in, but you have to have those or you're going to actually die. So everybody gets them, but they get them from the food, not from having to eat the oil as oil. Right. Perfect. Thank you. And well, you kind of talked about this today, about the estrogenic effects when using soy and tofu. You, you did mention that today. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a small effect. So I wouldn't worry about that at all. They said, how about chicken and so on? Now, they used to fatten chickens by putting uh, estrogen pellets in the neck of the chicken. Now, if you were a man and you ate the neck of that chicken with the pellet, you'd get a big dose. That might cause a little problem. But otherwise, in general, it's such a small amount. It doesn't cause any problem. Terrific. And you talked about the Epic Oxford study. So is that a good study? What do people think about that study? Yes, yeah, somebody there mentioned it was, it was not a good study. They are right. And I know the reason why it was not good. The group that was being studied was compared to what was supposed to be representative of the country. But it wasn't. They were much healthier than the people in the country. Their death rate was much lower. And so the results didn't mean anything. Well, but that doesn't mean everything in the study didn't mean anything. What I said about the calcium and so on, the fracture, it, I think was useful. But it's true that the study as a whole wasn't right because the, the, the group that was supposed to be compared to was not representative of the nation as a whole. Thank you. And here's a question about the second meal. What is good to eat for the second meal? And in case people didn't see the first show with you, what's good to eat for the first meal? Well, now I said quite a bit about the first meal, but the second meal, uh, I was skidding around the, to the question. I never really answered well. I was back to the first meal all the time. Uh, but after you heard the stuff on cancer, you know a little bit more about the vegetables. Uh, so what are the, the good foods? Have you heard of haystacks? Haystacks? haystacks um, Ever eaten haystacks? I, wait, a actually, I think I have it, it, at an Adventist man's house. So tell me what it is. Okay, if you have a large group, it's easiest to do it this way. You have some kind of chips, and then you have guacamole, and you have beans and lettuce and uh, tomatoes. That's what, what a haystack is. And you can serve a large group with just a few items like this. Uh, so that, that's a useful thing. Uh, olives, we usually have olives on it. I think tofu is a good food that I use for lunch. And have you heard of tofu skin? Tofu skin? I don't think I have. The peel. I, they, I see it in China hanging over the fences, drying it out. And then you, you can stuff it with something, you know. Uh, so that's good, too. I think the stuffed peppers, snow peas. I like snow peas. Uh, beans and potatoes when we were poor, uh, mushrooms, mushroom, I like mushroom soup, but it's too salty. 
So if I'm going to have some mashed potatoes, I'll use mushroom soup for the salt and the potatoes. I want, if it's too salty, it doesn't by itself. Uh, I like pumpkin. Sweet potato pie. Have you ever had sweet potato pie? Actually, pumpkin I have. Pie. Yeah. Uh, pumpkin pie. Uh, sandwiches. You have all kinds of sandwiches. Uh, I, I like avocado. I like lettuce, tomato sandwiches. Uh, macaroni, the potato salad. Macaroni. Doesn't grow well in my garden, does it in yours? <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. You know, it's still, it's, the pastas are still a processed kind of thing. So I don't look upon it as the ideal thing. Uh, I like my wife's oatmeal waffles. Uh, they're healthy waffles. Uh, I think lentils have less gas. They're, they're good. You, you, all the beans and lentils. You can make soups. You can make stews. Uh, I think when you have different kinds of breads, it makes the, the meal more interesting. Cornbread, all kinds of breads you could have. Uh, let's see. Yeah, basically uh, what Mary's saying is the haystacks you're describing is what we often call nachos. Yeah, that's right. Nachos, but then you put the guacamole in everything. Okay. Uh, no. I just want to read a really nice comment from Heather. Besides being amazing, Dr. Scharfenberg is the cutest human in the entire world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think uh, casserole, cashew casserole. Now, you may not have veggie burgers. Veggie burgers mean substitute. Uh, it's gluten. You know, gluten by itself is not a helpful food by itself. But you put something with it, like nutritional yeast. Uh, so uh, the Chinese, for all of their lives, years and years, have been living on gluten. They have lots of gluten. That's why I learned to like gluten. Uh, cauliflower, have you ever tried cauliflower fried in a batter? I don't eat fried foods. You don't eat any fried foods? Okay. No, nope. but I have an air fryer, so I could make it that way. Uh-huh. Uh, let's see. I, 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 I saw this over in Slovakia. I'd never seen it before. Uh, there was one person that had a comment and said, why not eat meat? It has everything to start with. <laughs> he said, for 200,000 years, they've had it. And I said, well, I, I would like to find somebody who wrote about that who lived over 10,000 years ago. Just name him and let me see his article. <laughs> they, won't, they won't find anybody. Uh, but there's all kinds of foods that we can eat. There's soups, casserole. I don't really recommend a lot of soups. Over in Europe, it's soup every day. It's common. But I think less liquid is better because soup goes right down. It, you don't get the digestion starting in the mouth when you chew something. So the chewing of the food is good. Absolutely. Let's see. All right. Here's a question from the chat from Patty. Do you have thoughts or views on the cause or prevention of autism and why is there such a great increase? You know, there are people, I was in a, place the other day and it was a doctor who was sure they could cure it. There's no known cure for it. It has been increasing. I got on a train over in Europe and going to Belgium and fell across the uh, seat for me. The train was reading American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. <laughs> and he was a pediatrician. And he thinks it's not the milk but it's something additive that you chew the soy milk or to chew the milk substitute that's causing the problem. Uh, people were saying it was immunization. It's not. They, in, for example, in Denmark, they took all the kids who were immunized compared to them who were not immunized. 
there was no difference in autism rates. They've done that over in Japan also. Two areas of the world have done that. They didn't find any difference. But there is an increase. And we need to find it. And we ought to be able to find it through our epidemiological studies. We should. I'm amazed that we haven't done more to find it. Because it is a problem. And we don't know the answer. Okay, thank you. Here's a question about the soil. Mary says, I understand that fruits and vegetables are less nutrient dense today than in previous years due to soil and mineral depletion. So should we be eating more fruits and vegetables to make up for that? Well, it's, it's not really true. We have as much as they had before. But you know, a lot of people thought if they would grow things organically, it would be better. I remember a short fellow who, he, he believed this so strongly. He wanted to be New York City uh, or the New York State agriculture man. And he got the job finally. And he took soil from, from the countryside, put there, and some he grew the regular way and the other he did organic way. Hoping to prove without a shadow of doubt Organic was better. I invited him out to my facility to lecture to us, and he was so disappointed. <laughs> there was no difference between them, no difference. So uh, we really haven't found the big difference between them. We, I hope that they will someday find it, but I haven't seen it yet. There were little studies you might show, show something, but in general, all the big studies have not shown it. Right. It's not so much it's the organic, it's that people just aren't even eating fruits and vegetables. That, that's right. Yeah. All right. Here's another question. Where did it go? Oh, this is from Susanna. And she said, what are the worst dietary changes you've seen over the course of your career? Were people eating more healthfully in 1948 when you graduated from medical school? I think people usually eat more healthfully. I think now we got all these soft drinks came in. That was a real problem. All the soft drinks, the sugary things. Uh, we were getting more sugar in our diet than we used to. Uh, we're getting too much food, overeating. It was a big point. We got to be very fat in this country. So it was too much food and the wrong kinds. Mostly the, the drinking of the soft drinks were bad. In uh, people, people, for example, in Eastern Europe compared to Western Europe, there's more colon cancer in Eastern Europe than Western Europe. That's because they're eating much more meat in Eastern Europe than they are in Western Europe. So we can explain that colon cancer rate different. Uh, so I think the biggest difference is uh, we got, we're getting our, our tobacco under control here. Only about less than 10% of our people in California are adults are still smoking. So we're doing them pretty well there. But in Eastern Europe, everybody still smokes. 40% of the men are still smoking. It's terrible. The activists have never heard anything bad about tobacco. We tried to get students to stop, stop smoking, get them interested in coming to a program to learn about it. They weren't interested at all. The head of the class, Class president, he smokes. They all go out and smoke. They just follow him. They don't follow what the doctor says. Uh, and so smoking in Europe is still bad. Uh, <clears throat> but <clears throat> the food in the U.S., we have much more processed stuff. Uh, we're still on a high meat diet here. And we know enough now to show that that is not good. Yep. Jill wants to know, if health, can healthy eating uh, prevent glaucoma or help glaucoma? Uh, not really. Not really. What about cataracts? No. People past 80 start to get cataracts. I had cataracts when I was 84. I had them taken out, put in 2020 lenses, 
threw my glasses away because I could read 2020 <laughs> with good lenses. And, you know, having the surgery taken out, you always worry about it. My father had to be flat in bed for three days afterwards. When I had it, I could get up and run around right away. And it only took about five minutes each eye to do it. I did only one eye at a time. Nice. Let's see. We got any other. Oh, what about vaping? I'm sure that's not good. They didn't have that when you were growing up, did they? No. Vaping is a, still a problem. Many of the vapors, if, if they go back to smoking, it, uh, it, vaping is still a problem. We have to talk against that in Europe quite strongly. There are people using it to try to get off tobacco, but it's helping many people go on it. I think for tobacco overseas, we need to tax it like we did here. Taxing it, raising the prices really help people stop. Absolutely. But but few, there are fewer smokers though now, right? Oh, yes. We gradually had more and more places where you're not allowed to smoke. They gradually increased that. But, but I think pe maybe people are smoking less, but they're eating more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, when people get older, they relax more, work less, exercise less, and eat more. We should just do it the other way around. When we get older, we should eat less, <laughs> exercise more. <laughs> and we aren't doing it. We're going the other way. You have more money when you're older, relax. You can buy more food, eat what you want. Yeah. Oh, Susanna says, will you share your wife's oatmeal waffle recipe? It sounds delicious. Do you have it written down somewhere? We could put oh, it in the show notes. Well, I'll tell you what it is. Two, two, two recipe. Two cups of oats. Uh, two cups of water. Two tablespoons of oil we use, but you wouldn't have to. There's other ways of doing that. Yeah, you could use a banana like Tammy did when you came over to my house for waffles. Yeah, yeah. And you need something to make it brown. You need half a banana, some applesauce for apple, something to make it brown, carbohydrate. That makes it brown. Uh, we put a little salt with it, but not much. Uh, so that's all it is. It was oats. Oh, by the way, you can use any leftover breakfast cereal. It's cooked breakfast cereal. Put it in there. You could do it. But it's oats and water and uh, something that carbohydrate uh, and a little, we use a little oil. You could probably use something else other than oil. Uh, if you have a nonstick waffle maker, you don't really need oil. Yeah, if you get a good waffle wire. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, you really want me to ask this question? I have a feeling I know the answer, but what about recreational marijuana? <laughs> Yeah, I'm opposed to that. Yeah, you know, over there in Netherlands, they allow people to have marijuana. And so we asked the people, you think there's any problem with it? No, oh, no. But I remember once uh, driving my car and I thought it was on its side. I thought it was driving it on its side. <laughs> he didn't know what he was doing. He was mentally off because it was marijuana. So there was a problem with marijuana. Yeah. People always want good news about their bad habits, Dr. McDougall said. Did you know Dr. Walter Kempner or know of him? I knew of him. The reason I knew of him was uh, President Roosevelt died from a stroke. Uh, he wasn't given much advice. His blood pressure was 300 systolic. And his doctor told him, well, it's a little high, but normal for your age, which is ridiculous. So when Truman became president, he started the Framingham study. Why do we have these people dying of heart attacks and stroke? And they went to work on that. The first thing they found was smoking caused a problem. Second thing they found was obesity caused the problem. And they've gone on and on, and we got a lot of information on diet wise now. Meat, milk, and eggs problems, and cholesterol problems. So we got a lot of information. And uh, 
and it was to get people to do it was the next thing. But we started on the tobacco first. Obesity, we got fatter. So we're happy to work hard on the obesity problem. Yeah. Thank you. Let's see what else we have here. There's a question about stomach cancer. I just saw it. Where did it go? Uh, what are there specific, Elisa wants to know, are there specific foods for people with stomach cancer to eat? I have to tell you, there was a high administrative person in my church who was quite a mediator. He got stomach cancer. They did surgical operation, removed the cancer. But he got letters from everybody around the country telling him what to do. Everybody had a different idea, this food or that food. And he didn't have time to read them all. So he formed a committee, three people, head of our nutrition department in Loma Linda, and I and another person, dietitian, were on that committee. And we ended up, there's one thing we're sure of. You should stop eating meat. Be a vegetarian. Okay? He became a vegetarian. Four and a half years went by. There was no recurrence. And he thought that advice was just maybe, maybe just happenstance. He went back to eating meat. Stomach cancer recurred. Then he asked us to come and pray for him. But, but so I, I think meat is one of the big problems. Yeah. Okay. How do you, Heather wants to know how you feel about green smoothies. Some doctors are good with them, but some say you need to chew your food. How do you feel about that? I, I think you need to you need to chew. Yeah, you, you bypass and chewing. And you see the first enzymes that work on the food come from the salivary glands or the mumps, the mumps, the parotid gland. And, they, and if you just swallow it, liquid, uh, you don't chew it. I think chewing is important. Yep. Uh, John wants to know, how do you feel about vitamin D supplementation, either in food or otherwise? I think we need it. Now, when you're young, you might not need it if you can get it all from the sun. But at my age, it has to go to the skin. My skin's working at half speed. It has to go to the liver. The liver's working at half speed. Has to go to the kidneys, gets changed again to make an uh, to make a hormone, which we call a vitamin. <laughs> vitamin D, but it's a hormone made by the body. See? But all those organs are working at half speed at my age, so my D goes down. Overweight people, it gets bottled up in the fat depots. We think so. You can't use what you got. You've got to take huge doses if you're overweight to try to get your D level up to where it should be. So the D and the uh, B12, the vegan needs, and older people need them. The rest you can get in the food. And it's best to get it in the food if you can. But those two, you're going to have to have pills. Yep. Let's see. Uh, what are the best foods for kidney health? All right. I think the thing you have to cut back on is protein. One out of seven Americans has chronic kidney disease. And the nephrologists all agree that if they had eaten a low protein diet, we could reduce our kidney death rate by about a third to one third of what it is down to 32 percent they said so it's too much protein that's the advantage of a vegetarian diet there's less protein in than the regular diet 
Yep. Do you drink anything other than water? Uh, I don't like to drink much with the meals. And the I, I like juices, but the recommendation of the nutritionist is don't go on juices. For example, orange juice increases the risk of diabetes, whereas whole orange decreases the risk. And it bypasses the end, the salivary glands, the enzymes, the chewing effect in the mouth. So uh, I, I, I like juices, but I don't try to use them that much. I like to cut back on juices. Yep. Uh, when is your birthday? I know the answer. December 15th. You'll be 100, right? Yes. Well, maybe you can come on the show that day. And yeah. that, <laughs> that would be amazing. Okay, let's see. Yeah. Um, oh, do, Bethany wants to know if you have an exercise routine and what your exercise routine is. Well, you know, I, I tried to explain, I think the first time, as far as longevity is concerned, I've outlived both my brothers 13, 16 years. But I, at 51, gave up my job teaching at Loma Linda, teaching nutrition, and I went out and bought 26 acres at Northwark, backed into the National Forest, uh, got it for $28,000. And it was all woods, bought a chainsaw and started working. I exercised a tremendous amount. I had two acres under cultivation. I planted 80 fruit trees. I cleared a pathway for about a quarter of a mile to get that to, back to civilization. Uh, but I did a lot of exercise. So I think exercise in midlife from age 40 to 70 is the time we need to exercise the most. There's evidence that it decreases the risk of Alzheimer's disease. So I, I think we should exercise mostly in midlife. Uh, now, I should do some now, uh, but I, I did do it in midnight. I did a tremendous amount of exercise. So that's why I outlived my brothers. Right. Uh, Jill is saying, can I eat some chicken and fish and a little meat if it's mostly vegetables, fruit, and beans and be okay? But I do want to say that she posted earlier that um, she, I believe she has diabetes and many people in her family have died of cancer. Yeah. Well, I said that just one meal of meat a day or a week, it's going to increase your risk of cancer. Uh, and if you eat beans six days a week, you negate that risk and you're down to the risk of a vegetarian. So beans helps to negate the risk of that meat. And that's kind of interesting. Have you always been vegetarian, people are asking? Well, I had fish three times in my life. Uh, I used to go out once a year, maybe, for uh, Japanese food. And they had rice with little hunks of beef in it. So that I had maybe once a year. Uh, by the time I was 18, from then on, never, ever tasted it. Yeah. Do you get out in the sun every day? No, not now. Uh, I, you see, at my age, you know, most of work even is done inside. And this ultraviolet can't get through that glass. Uh, so that's a problem. Uh, most of our people are working inside instead of outdoor. Outdoor work is better. But particularly when you're younger, when you can utilize the vitamin D. Yeah. Nice. Uh, June wants to know, what's your opinion of fluoride in water and maybe in general? You know, I did a seminar on that at Harvard. <laughs> and the man who thought uh, brushing your teeth was so important, he was in my audience. <laughs> he never asked any questions. I was surprised. But I think fluoride did a lot of good. And our young people don't have the tooth problem that they used to have. But they not only 
put it in the water. They're putting in toothpaste. They're putting in different things. Uh, so the fluoride did help to decrease the risk of cavities. Uh, so it, it did a lot of good. Uh, but now it's it's kind of in so many things. It's it's okay. I it's I don't think you need to worry especially to get go to get it. Okay. Well, I think I've got to all the questions. I hope you'll put December 15th on your calendar. You're still welcome to come back sooner and give any presentations you like. Tell us about, you You spoke just this week at Weimar Institute to like 300 people. What did you talk about? 330 people. <laughs> wow, 330. Well, actually, my second talk in the afternoon at two o'clock was kind of like what I gave the first one with you in January 26th more on cardiovascular disease. We now know that from lifestyle, you can cut back on cardiac, uh, cardiovascular disease, 80% heart attacks and stroke. And 88%, you can reduce diabetes, 88% with this proper uh, program of avoiding the seven risk factors, which is smoking, alcohol, uh, exercise instead of inactivity, keeping your weight down, and less meat and uh, sugar. And then they added two others, keep your blood pressure down and keep your uh, blood cholesterol down. Now, you won't have any problem with those two if you do the first five. But let me talk to you about blood pressure and salt. Now, I'm gonna give it to you from the public health standpoint. You have to lower your salt to about half of what people are getting to make it really worthwhile. Now in the Amazon basin, those Aborigines down there, they don't use any salt and they never have high blood pressure. And if you take rats and do rat studies, and if you give them plenty of potassium, that means fruits and vegetables, no matter how much salt you give them, it's not gonna hurt them. So my thing is, from the practical standpoint, if you make laws that you can't put with so much salt in the bread, pretty soon the bread will be tasteless and people won't buy it, and they'll go out of business. Uh, <laughs> most people are not gonna lower their salt intake that much to make it effective. But if you individually want to do cooking from scratch in your kitchen, you can get it down and it does do some good. But Public health-wise, we don't think we're able to persuade industry, persuade enough people to do it. So public health-wise, they're not pushing that hard on reducing salt, although we know it works if you get it done well enough. That's great. Here's a question from Stephanie about teeth health. Do you think it's okay to get your teeth cleaned twice a year? Yes, I'd recommend it. Nice. But you should know that uh, there's, when you eat sugar, particularly between meals, it goes to your hypothalamus, which connects with your parotid gland here, where we get the mumps, which connects with the teeth and controls the fluid movement in the teeth. So if you're eating between meals, sugar, it uh, reverses the flow in the teeth of the food, increases the risk of cavities. We have that whole mechanism all figured out what the, what the organisms are. We've identified them chemically. And uh, so Dr. Steinman at Global University Dental School, he did these studies and showed to us that what we ate, how we ate, was as important, if not more so, than brushing the teeth. Nice. All right. Uh, let's see. Well, this is great. Well, it's so good to see you, Dr. Scharfenberg. What have you got planned for the rest of your day? <laughs> if somebody's coming to visit me in a few minutes. Okay, well, I'll let you get that call, and I hope to see you soon. Okay. Take care thanks. and thanks. Thank you, Dr. Scharfenberg. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow with Dr. Joan Ifland for Food Addiction Friday.